Dogs need to work for their leaders so they can earn the essentials of a good life. It's the way their brains are programmed. Some of them, though, they don't make it easy, do they? Now, this isn't all about the person on the other end of the leash, but hey, you're the leader, so we're going to start by setting you up to succeed. Does anybody here have a dog who just has a hard time following instructions? It's not unusual. Please don't feel bad. Put it in the comment line. Tell me about it, and we're going to talk about it right now. In fact, you're welcome to ask me any question about cats or dogs. Uh, horses are fair game, too. Um, and not just behavioral. I spent many years in general practice, and I still manage internal medicine as part of many of my behavior cases. Any questions at all? Let them rip. This is a great time to get information. And by the way, in case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel. I'm residency trained in veterinary behavior medicine, and this is Miss America. Miss America, honey, would you sit up so people can see you? There you go, see? That's our beautiful border collie. That's why her name is Miss America. And this is Tony, one of our two fuzzy cats, and the other fuzzy white guys on the floor. And Carolyn will toss a couple of cat treats up here in just a minute because they have learned from doing these Facebook Lives with me for the last two years that, um, you know, when they see me camp out here in my upstairs office, this is what happens. We get, uh, we get treats if we show up on the, uh, on the table, on the writing table. So um, I uh, hope you can hear me. If you can hear me loud and clear, please hit the wow button just so that I know that I'm not having any technical difficulties because that's happened. And if you find this information helpful, send me some hearts just so that I know that we're doing something that's valuable to pets and their people. Um, I'd like to start with a story of um, a situation that I became very uh, intimately aware of. Oh, wonderful. Oh, Kathy, you're here. Oh, look, Carla is here too. Wonderful. Thank you guys for coming. And thank you for the hearts. I haven't said anything yet, but I'm about to. So way back in the day, in um, had to have been 1983, I had this wonderful Airedale. There he is right there. His name was Juan Gomez. Martha, thank you for coming. And Juan Gomez was named for an excellent, um, one of the pioneers, actually, of veterinary radiology. You know, you have to name pets after somebody famous if they're going to... Um, uh, you know, become really famous themselves. <laughs> like Miss America here. Or Tony, he was named by our sons when they were much younger. Uh, he's 14 now. When we got him as a baby, they named him for Tony the Tiger. And of course, Gaston is named for somebody in, in my good wife's family lineage. Um, he might not have been famous, but the cat is. So anyway, we have uh, this man, Big Jim. He attended the basic obedience class that I did with Juan Gomez. And Big Jim, a uh, really nice man, but actually his name was Jim. I didn't call him Big Jim, but I regarded him as Big Jim because Big Jim was a very big man. He must have been six foot three. And uh, Vicky, hey, thank you for coming. Vicky, yeah. Carolyn will pass me the iPad here and just, oh, there we go. Thanks, Carolyn. So that I can, oh, there's Gaston. He says it's time for food. Um, okay. All right, I don't have the, I don't have anybody, sh well, the darn, ah. whoops. Oh, you need to take it back? Maybe, let me see here. I don't have, oops, yeah, if you don't mind taking it back, Carolyn. Hold on one second, um, uh, I'm not able to bring the darn, oops, wait a minute, let me see. Um, well, shoot, I'm not, successful at bringing the people up this time. Anyway, they'll be up there pretty soon. Um, so, Big Jim had this wonderful golden retriever named Tinkerbell. She was about six months old and a just the cutest, happiest golden retriever, but had one of those soft personalities. And it frankly might not have been the best match between Big Jim and Tinkerbell. Um, but, um, <laughs> And Beth Miller is here. Wonderful. Juan was such a great dog. You remember Juan. Yeah, Beth was on my staff back in those days. And he went on to compete in obedience work. It wasn't really the original idea. Started with basic obedience. And well, he just loved it. And I thought, well, gee, you, you know the basic commands, but all he wanted to do was work. And 
so we went on to the advanced novice class and ultimately we started to compete. And uh, after a few years, he was nationally ranked um, as an obedience competition Airedale. He was just splendid. And he was, he was this man's best friend, I'll tell you. And he, well, he taught me a lot about fatherhood before I was quite ready to, to actually have children, but that's a different story. Anyway, so we're in obedience class with Juan and Big Jim and Tinkerbell, the, the golden retriever with a very soft personality. And so when Big Jim told Tinkerbell to come when called, and gave a little tug on that leash, oh, she just shrank right into the floor. She would roll over, expose her tummy, and he'd come over and he'd try to make her sit up, you know, stand up, Tinkerbell, and poor Tinkerbell would just get freaked out and dribble urine. Now, he did not mean to be unkind. Believe me, I mean, it's not like he was a bosom pal of mine, but he was a decent man. But he didn't understand how to deal with a personality that was so much different than his. And Tinkerbell didn't understand how to deal with him either. It was very clear that this man and his dog loved each other, but there was a real disconnect. Now, there was an instructor for this class, a, name, a lady named Leslie, a young woman, and she was in the Air Force, which is neither here nor there, except you expect these military people to be you know, you're going to do it right. But Leslie wasn't like that. She was very empathic, actually, towards Jim and towards Tinkerbell. And, you know, during breaks in the class and after, she'd talk with Jim and she'd say, now, you can slow it down a little bit with Tinkerbell and you can lower your expectations. In other words, only expect her to start coming to you and begin to reinforce that. You don't have to have immediate perfection every single time. And you could tell Big Jim was trying hard to, to grasp that concept. But it was a pretty wide chasm between what this man thought was a reasonable expectation of his dog and what the dog was capable of doing because she got overwhelmed. And so one of the things in bringing out the best in a dog, or maybe anybody else, try to walk a mile in their shoes like Leslie, the, the instructor of that class, did, try to understand what it is that's going on with the other pet or the other person and try to adjust and, and fine tune what we're doing for them. And so when we have a dog who just doesn't understand how to do what it's told, and this is especially true with puppies, and you want to start that obedience training as soon as you get a baby. You want to start them right away understanding that they can earn the essentials of life from their person. And this is really important because Many people, you know, you hear them say, oh, don't give your dog food for, for doing as it's told because then the dog believes you're just bribing it and uh, it's only going to work for the food. It doesn't work for you to please you. But you know what? It doesn't work like that anyway. Dogs love us. They are man's and woman's best friend for some very important reasons, but they are into survival. Never mind that you have a good income you are not going to run out of dog food at your house. They're not going to foreclose next month. This dog really doesn't have anything to worry about, right? Well, that's human logic, and it's quite legitimate. But the dog doesn't get that, because even though they are domesticated and they are adapted to living in our homes with us, you know, the call of the wild is only just below the surface. And so, oh, Martha's here too. Wonderful. Whoops. And we can hear you. Thank you, Carla. Um, and Manners is here, too. Oh, my goodness. Boy, we've got a good crowd. I'm delighted. So um, we, have, um, we have these dogs who look to their leader as the, controlling all of their resources. And everything is a resource except air to breathe and water to drink. And you notice Miss America here panting in my lap is not asking Mother May I if she can have that next breath. She knows that she's entitled to air and water, but everything else is a privilege that they have to earn. And boy, there's this, here's an exercise in empathy, is recognizing that these other species are very different than we are. Cats, on the other hand, like Gaston here, you can't see him very well because he's on the other side of the iPad. Here, let me move this over here, Gaston. You can camp out here if you like. Um, they see things very differently. And, you know, despite what you may have heard, we humans are actually smarter than our pets. And so they, um, we can learn, in this case, canine leadership. They are not usually capable of learning much 
human followership. Now, dogs who are well-adjusted, don't have anxiety disorders or some other behavior problem, um, you know, they can adapt, but even still, we can bring out their best by laying out a structure for them that completely capitalizes on their innate needs, and that is survival. Dogs seem to believe that there's going to be a famine starting in about 20 minutes. And if I don't get everything I can right now, I'll be the guy who doesn't make it this year. Well, that's an essential component of survival in the wild, and they're very capable of doing that. If all of us humans joined a one-way trip to Mars and they had to figure it out on their own, they will form up canine social groups and they will establish a territory. They will gather resources like food and breeding females to pass on their genetic code, all the natural fundamentals that are hardwired into their canine brains, and they bring that with them into our homes. So your dog loves you, but he or she looks to you to provide the essentials of life. And it isn't just food. They need to earn interactions. They don't believe that's an entitlement. You may think it is, but you're making a mistake because you want your dog to earn it because that brings security to this species. If you give it to them the way they get it, then they're going to go, wow, I feel better. If I had much anxiety, it's going away now because I'm seeing a structure here that is absolutely in line with the programming right upstairs here. Okay? Now, that does not mean that you don't give your dog all the attention and love and, and hugs and everything you want, but you know, require that dog to earn it. In other words, only give those things to your dog when you see behavior you want. So, if we're training a dog to come when called, and the case with Big Jim and Tinkerbell, here's what Big Jim could have done. And now, this is back in 1983, a little while ago, huh? And, uh, you know, behavior medicine was hardly in its infancy then. There's been an enormous amount of research. And here's just one of the very simplest fundamentals, is in order to avoid triggering a dog's fear, or even a dog who isn't fundamentally fearful, but just bring out their best to make it easy for them, is don't be so darn big. Get small. In other words, you know, we stand much taller than most dogs, don't we? So if you squat on the floor with a puppy and you turn your side just like another dog would to show that, hey, I mean you no harm, and don't look directly eyeball to eyeball, just look off to the side, and you have that leash. And of course, I can't really demonstrate that with Miss America in my lap here very well, can I, girlfriend? But anyway, you've got the leash. And Carolyn, can I have that treat bag, please? Oh, thank you for those hearts. Um, and um, the, uh, so you're squatting on the floor, you know, maybe six feet from your dog, or five feet because you're using a six-foot leash. And Tony says, ooh, dog treats? I'll take one of those. He doesn't care. Um, and so you've got this dog sitting on the floor, and you back up, and you have a leash. And you show that treat to the dog. In other words, you want to earn this little bit of sustenance, an opportunity to survive one more minute. And then you say, Miss America, come. And she comes and she gets the treat. Okay? Keep it simple. And in fact, I say start five feet away. Start two feet away. Make it really easy. Now, here's something that they teach you in obedience class. And it's almost always great advice. And that is that when the dog starts coming in, you make a big fuss. You can jump around and clap your hands and have a wonderful time because you want your dog to follow your emotional lead. You are the leader. So in the context of teaching a dog to come when called, you want that dog to go, yeah, I'm all about, gentlemen, are we, uh, are we exchanging course words together here? This is a family show. Oh, that four-letter cat language there. Okay. So, um, so you want that dog to just understand that enthusiasm is what this is all about, okay? And so when your puppy or your dog shows up in front of you and earns that immediate reinforcer of the food, I mean, you're holding it out, you're showing it to the dog, dog comes and gets it immediately. You tell your dog how wonderful she is and you pat her on the head. Petting turns out to be a very potent uh, reinforcer, okay? Um, ah, Vicki, on how to medicate a semi-feral kitty. All right, let me not forget that. And Carolyn, would you make sure I don't overlook that one? Um, let me finish this little thought, Vicki, and we'll get to that because 
I certainly appreciate that, that challenge. So you want to uh, make it easy for the puppy to succeed. Now, what about Big Jim? Big Jim tried all that with little Tinkerbell, and the poor little dog just kind of melted on the spot. So good empathy, which I'm hoping that nice man gradually learned that through life because we do keep learning, don't we? And what he could have done would have been gotten real small on the floor, even sat on the floor, and very quietly held out that treat just a foot or two away from that little girl dog and said, Tinkerbell, I didn't even have to use the word come initially, and just coax her in. And she would say, well, this enormous person is not looming over me, scaring the daylights out of me. Why wouldn't I come? And he may have learned over time that just low-key, very quiet verbal reinforcement would have been perfect for that dog. So enthusiasm, though, most dogs works very well when they start to come in and when they arrive, and then you can increase the distance and keep setting them up for success. So, you know, whatever works best for the individual. A little trial and error is okay. But what if you have a dog who causes the person to be really frustrated? All right. Let me talk about frustration for a minute. Uh, another word for frustration in this context is punishment. And let me tell you why so many people use punishment, and not just with their pets, but with their children. I don't know about you, but I was raised that way. It took me a long time to start digging my way past that. And of course, in veterinary behavior medicine, we have come to learn, just on the human side as well, that our training in a, in a behavior residency is, um, a lot of it came from the human side. Uh, many of the postgraduate courses that I took were in the biology department at the University of New Mexico and the psychology department. Um, and they, these things, they know from a lot of animal research for human behavior and vice versa, that the basics of learning theory are really the same regardless of what species you're talking about. And the reason that punishment is used so commonly is because it works fast. But there's more to it than that. A little more nuanced. So here is a statement from the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, and I know that's backwards, but it's the AVSAB, and you're welcome to go to their website, and they will, and you'll find this position statement on punishment and several others, and a lot of very good information. But I'm going to read you just a few of these, and then Vicky, I'm going to get to that feral cat medicating question. Okay. One of the essentials if punishment is going to be used effectively is timing, and it is difficult to time it correctly. In other words, in order for the animal to understand what it's doing wrong, the punishment must be timed to occur while the behavior is occurring. Usually we say immediately after, which means that within one second. Can you do react to anything in less than a second? Well, if you can, maybe you can be an effective punisher. Here's another issue with punishment that you better get right if you're going to use it, and that is that it can actually strengthen the wrong behavior. Okay? In order for punishment to affect a lasting change, it should occur every single time the undesirable behavior occurs. If the animal is not punished every time, then the times it is not being punished, it is actually receiving a reward. Additionally, those rewards are on a variable rate of reinforcement. In other words, it's inconsistent, okay? And we know that when we're going to teach somebody something, variable frequency and variable interval are actually the most effective ways. They don't know when they're going to get the reinforcer or the punishment. And because when they don't get punished, that equals a reward, then some of the time they're getting punished and some of the time they're getting reward for the same behavior. Now, we have an obligation not to confuse our subordinates, and they are our subordinates. It's not a bad word. It's essential to think of our dogs that way because that's the canine leadership that they fundamentally understand. We are the leaders. We control their access to resources. They rely on us for security and consistency, okay? So you better be doing this every single time which frankly is not humanly possible. So I've never known it to be, all right? And regardless of the strength of the punisher, it can cause some individuals to become extremely fearful. And in fact, that's what was happening with Tinkerbell with Big Jim. 
He didn't realize it, and frankly, I did not at the time either. I was in general medicine at that time. I hadn't started my in-depth study of behavior, but what he was doing by, you know, using a stern voice with little Tinkerbell and pulling that leash and, come Tinkerbell, that kind of thing, that dog was getting punished. She was just, didn't know what to do, so she rolled over and demonstrated her submissiveness to her leader because that what was in her little canine innate brain. Now, she was, I assure you, that if I had temperament tested the litter that she came from, I would have recognized that she was one of the lower ranking puppies in the group. And nothing wrong with those. You're either hardwired that way or not. It's genetic. Again, maybe not the best match for, for Big Jim. But some dogs on which an electric shock collar are used with a preceding tone, they may react fearfully to alarm clocks and smoke alarms and other things because they associate fear with the tone. So punishers, electric shock collars, harsh reprimands, jerks, hitting, gosh, you know, I'd rather not. Let me read you just a couple more brief things. Um, punishment can cause animals to develop a negative association with the person who's implementing it. You know, man's and woman's best friend? Let's nurture the friendship, shall we? Or even in the environment where it's being used. They can associate that. For instance, when punishment is used for training dogs to come when called, the dogs may learn to come at a trot or a walk or cower while approaching rather than returning to their owners at a fast run as if they're enjoying it. Or when punishment is used during obedience competition, what are you doing, girlfriend? Or agility training, dogs may perform the exercises with a lack of enthusiasm. Well, that certainly applied to Tinkerbell, didn't it? Owners may develop a negative association too. And this to me is one of the worst parts of this whole problem. When owners use punishment, they are often angry. And thus the expression of force is reinforcing them because it temporarily decreases their anger. And this has been established in human behavioral research. Those people may develop a habit of frequently becoming angry with their pet because it, quote, misbehaves in spite of their punishment. And I saw that happening with Jim. This may damage the bond with the pet. And by the way, even when it's appropriately, consistently, the proper strength, punishment, when it's used, the only way it can work, really, there's never anything about it that teaches the pet what to do instead of the punished behavior. So it doesn't have much value to us. Okay, thank you for all that. Now, um, suggestions on how to medicate a semi-feral cat. We can't touch him. He gets so stressed that he urinates and, and defecates on himself. It's heartbreaking. He needs a trip to the veterinary clinic for a body shave because he is so severely matted. All right, let's talk about a few of those situations, Vicki. Um, you are one of God's angels for taking care of this little cat because this is a big challenge and very few people are interested in investing that much love and energy knowing that they're only going to make a little difference. Feral cats, um, they're different than feral dogs. Many dogs who were raised as babies and, and, and largely into their adult lives as part of free-living feral groups they actually can learn to trust a person and become a pretty, de pretty decent, well-bonded pet. But cats, on the other hand, if they don't get the kind of gentle social contact with humans, starting when they're about three weeks old, um, and have plenty of it until they're at least 12 to 15 weeks, they tend to always be afraid of people. And you can take them in, and you can help them improve in that relationship, but you typically only make a little bit of difference. And so you have to accept that this is the way it's going to be with that kitty. Now the other thing that concerns me about this kitty and her mats, her mats, um, him, sorry, um, is why is that cat so darn matted? And as we know, cats typically groom themselves and when they don't and they become badly matted, um, certainly malnutrition where he came from could have been a factor. Um, but very often mouth pain prevents them from grooming properly. Mouth pain can result from infections of the gums, uh, teeth that are loose and painful, 
Uh, sometimes internal disorders like kidney failure can cause mouth pain. And so that worries me a lot. Now, you're, there's no question those mats need to go. But what I'm going to encourage you to do is find a veterinarian who is trained in what's called fear-free techniques. And if you go to a website called fearfreepets.com, I've got a locator there, and you can find a veterinary clinic that is certified fear-free. Now, you don't have to be fear-free certified to understand how to do some of this stuff, but it really makes a difference. And if a veterinary clinic has had that training, then um, they know exactly what to do. And no one should ever struggle with this cat, whether to give it a medication or to hold it still to have its mats removed. This cat needs to be pretty heavily sedated. And that's the only good way to do this. Now, there's a medication, um, and I'll spell it for you if you have a pen handy, and it's called gabapentin, G-A-B-A-P-E-N-T-I-N. Now, gabapentin comes in capsules, 100 milligram capsules. They're inexpensive. Your veterinarian can prescribe it. They might even have it in their pharmacy. And rather than having to give this capsule orally to your cat, you can open the capsule and dump the powder inside onto a small amount of soft food. And almost all cats, nothing applies to everybody, but almost all cats will eat it with energy. It tastes good. And an hour to two later, that's when you put the cat in the car and go to the veterinary clinic. And they're typically a lot calmer. Very safe stuff. GABA Pentin, G-A-B-A-P-E-N-T-I-N. Now that may not be enough for the doctor or the staff to gently be able to hold that cat and clip and remove those mats, but it's a very good start because if that cat is calm enough and it's in the carrier, and the best carriers are not the, the wire metal ones, but the plastic ones, where the top removes the little buckles on the side. And so this way, you cover that carrier with a towel before putting that with the kitty in your car, Cats feel much better riding in the car. They've had, she's, this little guy has had his gabapentin, I would say two hours prior to, to make sure it's really absorbed and on board. Cover the carrier with a towel so that there's no way this cat can see outside the carrier. Very gently carry it into the car and don't use the handle. They tend to dangle and sway, you know, like they're in a storm at sea, right? Carry it against your chest. It's a lot steadier for the cat. And then when you get to the veterinary clinic, you know, right now with COVID, most veterinary clinics, they don't allow the people to come in, but they take the pet in. Make sure that you tell that staff, hold the cat's carrier against the person's chest. Again, if they're fear-free trained, they know that already. Okay? So that cat goes in there, and what the doctor can do then, or the staff, towel is on top of the carrier, and they very quietly unbuckle the top. And as one person very slowly pulls that top off the bottom half, they take the towel and move it over the kitty. So this cat who's been sedated by this generous dose, very safe, gabapentin, okay? Then they can examine the cat and they may be able to do what they need to do. If not, they can give this cat a little injection into the hip of another sedative to add on to the gabapentin and have this cat safely, no stress, sedated and not only take care of those mats but do a good thorough physical exam the mouth the ears the eyes we can palpate the kidneys we can feel the kidneys in a cat right behind their last ribs you cannot with a dog but with cats you can check out the whole creature okay the joints the whole thing the heart lungs you you name it okay so nose to tail exam and while they're at it you should also ask them to submit a blood profile um, just to make sure that everything okay. Because again, there's reason for concern about internal organ function with cats who haven't groomed themselves. And everything needs to be figured out. Even if this cat had a beautiful hair coat, let's start out by understanding what the heck's going on. Let me see, did that? Um, yeah, so you know, you've done the best you can, but when a pet gets so stressed that they lose control of their, of their stool and their urine, that's telling us, oh boy, we're gone. We've gone a little too far. We need to back up and take a whole fresh approach. So I hope that helps. Let me see, are there any other questions? Ann Manners, two years. Yeah, and Ann's been mo to most of these things. Ann is my excellent sister-in-law in Tulsa. And Ann doesn't even have a dog, but she attends the ones I do on cats and the ones I do on dogs because she loves dogs too. 
And she's a lovely woman. And I'm so lucky to be part of her family. Um, so that's what I have to report. Um, anybody else have any other questions? This is a great time to ask. But you, you can put them on my Facebook page. And if you do, I'll address them. And oftentimes they're pretty good for my weekly column in the Albuquerque Journal, something I've been doing since 1996. Boy, time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and by the way, you can get my weekly column. We call it a media blog or a media post nowadays, don't we? Uh, because hardly anybody reads newspapers. And you can get my every Thursday, or almost every Thursday, Facebook Live. You can get them in your email box on Tuesday mornings. All you have to do is subscribe to my website. Go to Dr. Jeff Nickel, D-R-Jeff-N-I-C-H-O-L, drjeffnickel.com. And at the bottom of the page, of the homepage, you can subscribe. It's no cost. You just put your email address. And every Tuesday morning, you'll get those things in your email box. And I will send you, of course, at no charge, my Pet First Aid and CPR Guide. You know, I do these things every week because it's important to bring out the best in pets and their people. And I, and, uh, I love my work. I've been at it a long time. Beth can tell you that because she was with me after I'd only been in practice, I don't know, eight years or something when she came to, to work for us at our hospital. And we miss you still, Beth. You can come back anytime. Um, and I'll make sure you have a position. So there. Um, Beth is a nurse now in Texas. Um, I don't think she's coming back, but we'd like it if you did. So I think that's all I have to report. Just, you know, it's worth it to take the time to build a foundation of trust and choice and freedom for your pets before asking them to do things differently for you. Because pets, just like people, well, they can become obstinate if their leader only wants their needs met. It needs to be both ways. And so it's, you can always, at any point in the relationship, teach your pet that they can trust you not to intimidate them. So one of the greatest gifts that pets give us is they can teach forgiveness. And they will. They'll say, it's all right, let's start over. And you know, life gets pretty good with a pet, isn't it? Um, there was one more question here. Um, how do you handle, oh, this is from Carla, how do you handle a puppy straining on the leash? Bad puppy. Carla, do you have a new puppy? You have wonderful Aphrodite, the bulldog. But uh, to your question, um, you know, dogs have a very strong need to get off territory, to sniff and investigate, to read those bulletin boards. It isn't just picking up the scent of other dogs, which they do. Um, but dogs secrete a chemical, what's called a semiochemical. It's a pheromone-like substance from these little tiny glands that secrete this stuff between the foot pads. And these aren't a scent. Actually, they don't have a scent. They are communications. It is inhaled in the air that the dog breathes in as they sniff stuff on leash walks. And they are reading messages that are left by other dogs. And they are leading, leaving their own messages. Now, we don't understand enough about these yet to say much more than they are messages, but we have learned that. And this is essential. Dogs just absolutely have to do this. Yes, our pandemic puppy, Pug, and Dachshund Mix. Oh, congratulations, Carl. I didn't know that. That's very cool. <laughs> what fun. So yeah, they've got to get out and they have to do this. And that's why dogs absolutely go bonkers when you bring out the leash and say, let's go for a walk. They've got to do it. So. What we do is we let them do it, but you know you don't want to struggle and strain with the dog. They absolutely have to do this. So one great way of satisfying your new puppy's needs, Carla, is you can go to a dog park, and I would suggest waiting until all the vaccinations are up to date, and the puppies had a stool exam and had a routine dewormer, and I would routinely deworm that puppy every six months, at least, if you're going to the dog park. Um, but that doesn't make it a bad place. And if you want to have that puppy drag a nice long leash, like 20 feet, just in case something starts to go bad with another dog, you can rescue your dog. By the way, always carry something called spray shield. If I'd thought of this, I'd have one to show you. It's a little aerosol. You can order it online. And um, it has a range of about 15 feet, and it's citronella. It's not pepper spray. It's not mace. It doesn't cause any harm. It doesn't cause any pain. But if two dogs start to mix it up and you spray them both, including yours, 
with spray shield, and it's a citronella. Dogs hate that. Most people don't seem to mind, but dogs just hate it, and it causes confusion. And they go, oh my goodness, and it gives you an opportunity to grab your puppy and get the heck out of there. So don't be afraid of dog parks. I suggest going when there are not as many pets and people there, but let them run off leash and do all those normal things that they must do off territory so they can read those messages. Now, if a dog gets good and tired every day, whether it's at the dog park or a doggy daycare at a kennel, um, they're usually much better on leash. But one of the best things you can do if you've got a puppy or an adult dog whose needs are met like that, social interaction with other dogs, off leash, off territory, sniffing and investigating, getting good and tired, um, then you can go to a puppy obedience class. And here in Albuquerque, the best one is the same one I took Juan to way back in the day, is Sandia Dog Obedience Club. Um, I don't have anything against, you know, pet supply stores have them, but these are people who aren't necessarily the most highly trained dog trainers. The folks who give the classes at, at an obedience club, which is a nonprofit club, um, you pay for the upkeep on the building and that stuff. Those folks are all volunteers and they are obedience enthusiasts. It doesn't mean that they expect everybody to go on and compete the way Juan and I did, but a couple people do. But they understand the foundation of teaching a dog to want to work for you and show that enthusiasm because, by the way, if you did compete, that really matters in the obedience ring and you don't get that by scaring the daylights out of your dog. <laughs> okay, So it's a great way to go and there's a structure and you want that. Um, so you can then go with obedience training and it's much more than come and sit and down, but healing. And healing takes time and it's a gradual process. But that puppy has got to get her needs met first. And so it's always best before going to class, obedience training class, or practicing the skills, is to give your puppy a chance to run hard, throw the ball, throw the frisbee, go to the dog park, whatever, because a tired dog is a happy dog. And so back to your walks, Carla. If you let that little puppy of yours run around the yard, throw the ball and get her all crazy and, and, and active and good and tired, and then go for the walk. Because the walk is good exercise for you and Tom, but it's not much exercise for a dog. That isn't why the dog likes to go. The dog has social reasons. Even if they don't encounter another dog, they're picking up all those scents and pheromone communications. Um, so you go out there for your purposes and your dog has her own purposes. But if you want to make this easier for everybody, get that dog good and tired and then go for a walk. Okay. Uh, oh, Amanda. Our one-year-old puppy, Lucy, jumps on us and sometimes nips at our hands. We're wondering how to get her to stop these things. Boy, there's a good one. And actually, that's going to be the subject of one of my Facebook Lives coming up. I've got it on my plan. It might be next week, actually. Uh, if not next week, the week after. I'm pretty sure it's next week. But anyway, let me give you a little preview on that one. Um, uh, you know, puppies, uh, they love us. And they want all that physical contact. But that puppy needs to learn that the great privilege of physical interaction with its person is got to be an earned privilege. And so you're not going to punish that, but what you're going to do is you're not going to reinforce it when your puppy is crossing the line and demanding that interaction. That's not okay for a subordinate in a canine social group, which is how our dogs see our relationship. And so what you need to do is enforce the structure, which by the way, if your dog, and you have a, a one-year-old puppy, Lucy, uh, if Lucy were part of a free living social group, the leader and the other dogs in the group would have made it very clear, these are the rules of social engagement here. We don't cross that line, okay? Well, you didn't know that, and so this puppy actually believed that you wanted that behavior. Really? Because the puppy jumps all over you and you say, stop it and get down and all that stuff. Puppy's getting a response, and any response from the leader is considered by a dog of any age as a reinforcer for the behavior and for the emotional state of that dog at that moment because they believe that they're not entitled to a response from the leader. So you can yell and swat and all that stuff, and that dog goes, hey, not only am I earning a response, which I would not get, if this leader of mine didn't want this behavior repeated, 
Not only that, but a young puppy like Lucy may think you're playing, okay? So we need to put the kibosh on this nonsense without punishment and without confusing the puppy into thinking it's what we want. So what I'm going to encourage you to do right now, Amanda, is leave a six foot or longer leash on Lucy to drag around the house all the time when she's indoors, okay? It becomes second nature to everybody pretty quick. And not if, but when she decides to, you know, fling herself at you again, your first step will always be the same, and that is completely ignore. I mean completely ignore. Like, there's no such thing as Lucy. You've never heard of it, okay? Uh, that can be hard to do. Practice that skill. Now, if you had a dog named Lucy at those times, which you don't because you're an Olympic-level ignorer, she would look at you and go, Oh, my goodness. I've lost my relationship with Amanda. Oh, my God. What will happen now? If I don't have this relationship, I won't get behavioral cues. I won't be allowed to go with our group, our canine social group, and find food resources and, and protect our territory. And uh, I'll be the one who doesn't make it this year. That is fundamental canine thinking. That's just how they are. We have abundant research to support that. Okay? So what you've done is taken something away from her. And that's a punishment, actually. It's a negative punishment because you've taken something away. Positive punishment is when you add in an aversive, like, you know, a swat or an electric shock collar or something like that, right? You wouldn't do that. But you're going to take something away. Okay, you're going to take away the relationship completely. There isn't any relationship. There's no such thing as Lucy. Immediately ignore behavior you don't want so that the puppy doesn't inadvertently believe that it's been reinforced. Okay? But you've got that leash, which dogs actually don't understand. If we're communicating with our dog with the leash, they understand it is a communication tool. But if there's no communication because you're an Olympic-level ignorer, and Lucy's looking at you going, oh my goodness sake, I've lost it. I've lost the relationship. I am a ship adrift at sea. Okay? And by the way, canine leaders ignore their subordinates often when they see behavior they don't want. That is fundamental to the canine brain as well. All you're doing is giving Lucy canine leadership. You're not teaching her anything new. She already gets that. Okay? You need to get that. Okay? So you ignore all that nonsense. Then you grab the leash and then get up and walk away. Lead the leash to some other part of the house. Just round a corner to another room. Now, if you had a little dog named Lucy on the other end, which of course there's no such thing, but you would have taken her out of the context and you go around a corner and you just stand there for another five or ten seconds, continuing to completely ignore, and then you steal a quick glance. Did you notice me steal a quick glance at Miss America like that? Yeah, that's a quick glance. And if you notice a softer body posture, you very quietly reinforce and you go, good dog, like that. You don't get enthusiastic at that time because your subordinate will follow your emotional lead. And here we had Lucy who was just highly aroused inappropriately and we want to set her up for success. So we've ignored, we've gone to a different context so that she's out of that other place. And you stand there, and she's looking at you going, Oh, God, if I'm, if I'm quiet, if I show a calmer emotional state, that's likely to get reinforced. And sure enough, it does. You don't have to wait for her to be zen and totally relaxed. Just improved. And you go, Good dog. And she goes, Oh, Amanda's calm. Me too. Repeat hundreds of times, and she'll get it. But here's the other side of the equation, and that is catch her doing something right every chance you get. This is called operant conditioning. Humans are operant learners as well. And it's that old what gets reported, let me start again, what gets rewarded gets repeated. You know, you read the parenting books or the leadership books, you know, they all say that. And it's true, not only of humans, but of dogs. What gets rewarded gets repeated. So don't confuse her, like, don't feel bad about this mistake. Everybody does that wrong until I tell them otherwise, okay? So you stop reinforcing, inadvertently reinforcing the wrong behaviors. And when she's calm, any old time she's calm, just say, good girl, Lucy. Let me do it hundreds of times a day. Good girl, you're calm, you're good. You get all wild and crazy, you lose. You lose the interaction. But you have control because you have the leash, okay? And you can go some other place and set her up for success. 
Anybody else? I think that's it. Well, everybody, thank you so much for sharing this time with me. I am just tickled to have this group of folks to share information with. And I'll see you all next Thursday evening. And uh, everybody, please be safe. And uh, uh, don't forget to wear your mask. I got another heart.